all the accommodations that we need until the hospital uh, is rebuilt. In October, we did not have a quorum. At the November meeting, I was elected as chairman of the Lower Cameron Hospital Service District. The former chairman, Tim DuPont, had resigned. Um, I had asked the Cameron Parish Tax Assessor to provide both current and projected ad valorem funding to the district, like a 10-year uh, view of the projected uh, tax income. The, as, as Tom mentioned, Stonebridge had requested to renegotiate the terms of the contract, citing higher cost of operations, and in light of what we hope to know will be um, higher tax to come, we I appointed a committee to begin discussion of the requested provisions to the contract. In, at the December meeting, the, the board received the proposals, and, and we did advertise for both the temporary facility, and I'll get to the permanent facility, on Central Auction House because it has the widest uh, viewership, of, uh, far wider than, than your official journal or you know, selected newspapers or however you might choose to do that. So we did it both electronically. So we received and we rejected both proposals for temporary facilities. We had two, not three, as has been stated. Cotton Commercial, and this is for an 18 month rental lease period. Cotton Commercial, the entire cost would have been $8,615,324 to lease the facility with a minimum of an eight month construction period to get that temporary facility up and running. Apex Site Services could, could construct within a minimum of a four month period um, once site work was completed. Their 18 month cost was $14,130,000. That was a lease cost. Um, and assuming, assuming that if uh, FEMA would actually fund the full 90%, and I now have 17 years of experience with FEMA and GOSEP through four or five name storms, um, we all know that there are always non-eligible costs in any FEMA project. But even if they were to fully fund it, <coughs> including site work that would not be used again for a permanent facility, we would have been looking at having spent at least 860,000 to 1.4 million, more likely one and a half million to $2 million of taxpayer dollars with nothing left to show for it at the end of the day when, when that lease property was removed. Um, I, I feel that our board has a fiduciary duty to be good stewards of taxpayer money. That made absolutely no sense, the exorbitant costs. So the board at that point agreed to search for a temporary facility. Um, the secretary treasurer to the board, who was, which was, is a paid position, um, had also, Greg Faber had indicated that he was going to resign but would transition in a new person. The board offered that position and um, Julie Trahan accepted that position. On January 24th of 2023, there was a weather event, as you recall, that damaged the temporary services location. Uh, reportedly, a strap at the top of the tent snapped in the excessive wind. The top blew off. Fire department staff returned the top to the tent. Later in that, the same week, it was verbally reported, that's from Stonebridge staff, that, they, that the staff in Creole was cleaning and sanitizing some of the equipment may need replacing and that they were hopeful that the tent would be again operational within the following week. And we actually, on uh, January 31st, we had an alliance meeting that morning. And I was very happy to be able to report that um, to all of the department heads and entities at that meeting. And that's what, because that's what we had, had uh, been informed was gonna happen. <coughs> That evening on January 31st at our regular board meeting, Stonebridge Health Systems announced the 30-day termination of their operating agreement, effective March 2nd, <coughs> 2023. At the same meeting, Liz Horman, who's the designated Region 4 coordinator, attended the meeting and discussed the extended use of the Western Shelter tent at the Creole location and announced that it was to be returned to Region 4 for any repairs that might be needed and would not be returned to South Cameron Memorial Hospital 
so as to be made readily available to other hospitals in the event of an emergency. So at that point, there was no possibility of um, having the tent repaired and returned. The, at the same meeting, the board approved issuing requests for qualifications for architectural and engineering services to design the new South Cameron Memorial Hospital at or above elevation requirements. In the period from February 1st, 2023 to March 1st, 2023, the 30 days within the termination notice. And I, let me say this, um, the Louisiana Department of Health and since then other uh, public entities have um, explained that normally a termination of a hospital operator contract, the industry standard, is 120 to 150 days. So we've had um, 30 days to do what normally takes place in four to five months. But we were successful. We were able to apply for a copy of the tax identification letter, which was needed for Medicare purposes and licensing purposes, as a copy was not available in the records that had been provided to the district. We filed for change of ownership of the hospital licenses. We applied for Medicare provider numbers, we contracted with Bayou Storage for receipt and storage of equipment and a mobile generator that's an asset of the hospital, and we contracted with reliable document storage and shredding for receipt storage and management of the medical records, and those are available through that company upon patient request. So we did all that in 30 days that normally take 120 to 150 days. At the February 6th special meeting, we approved engaging Gotcha Sand Law Firm from Lafayette, Louisiana with over 20 years of experience of special counsel in the areas of medical and hospital matters. Mr. Baird, of course, is, serves as general counsel to our board, but in specific matters, we, will, we have used Gotcha Sand Law Firm. And at that time, we were also informed that the Cameron Parish Health Unit may be available for temporary use, and that was good news. On February the 20th, Danny Laverne, our director of um, the Office of Emergency Preparedness, organized a conference call with GOSEP and other state leaders and entities to discuss the availability of any emergency clinic or hospital resources that might be available. Uh, Mr. Barrett uh, participated in that call as well, and they had nothing that they could offer us. On February 27th at our board meeting, we changed insurance companies, moving to Hub International. We approved advertising for architectural and engineering services for permanent repairs and renovations to the Cameron Parish Health Unit, of course, pending your approval of our lease request. As required by GOSEP, due to significant change in scope and location previously advertised, so we could not use the, the original RFP that, that uh, had been um, advertised because the location and the scope was significantly different. We contracted with Computer One Incorporated. There were no uh, technology services available to the board. We rented a post office box until the hospital could return to its former location. We moved all bank accounts to B1 Bank and we approved submission of a letter in support of usage driven designation within the foreign trade zone 291 for Venture Global Calcasieu Pass terminal site in Cameron. And we were very proud to be able to do that. At the March special meeting, the board received submissions for individual review and scoring from five firms that had submitted to provide A&E services for the new elevated hospital and um, uh, approved contracted services of both a FEMA and medical expert to assist in the scoring. At the March 29th meeting, we adopted the millage rate as required. We received the cumulative scoring of submissions by those five firms, and the board approved um, Huff Power, WHCL Architecture, which is a joint venture comprised of the architecture firms, um, Huff Power Studio and WHCL Architecture. Josh Huff Power, who's with us today and is, is going to uh, address you shortly, um, at, is the partner in charge, and, and they were uh, approved for both the, the permanent hospital and repairs and renovation to the temporary location um, as well as design and management of new construction. Next, the board approved making a formal request of you to repair and renovate the Cameron Health Unit 
to lease as a temporary clinic with potential emergency service if, it's, if possible to be made code compliant. And we also received from the Cameron Parish District Attorney a complete file with a copy of the ordinance and statutes that apply to Lower Cameron Hospital Service District from the date of its establishment to the present. That's a very valuable file and we're very grateful to have that backup information. On April 1st, we were apprised that the 2021 and 2022 annual audits had not yet been submitted uh, by the firm of Joey L. Brose CPA and that the 2021 audit was in process. Julie Trahan has uh, been instrumental in trying to pull together because our, our records are not complete, but pull together what the CPA needs. Um, last uh, April the 3rd, just last week, the architects assessed the site of the new South Cameron Memorial Hospital and the structure of the former Cameron Parish Health Unit as a potential temporary location. They had a, a staff here that spent the day um, in both locations. <clears throat> Yesterday, I received a call from Steve Russo, the Secretary of the Louisiana Department of Health. He called to confirm that there had been no emergency services offered in Cameron Parish since Hurricane Laura. He, if that's similar, very, that goes along with what um, the District Attorney just mentioned to you. I myself, as a taxpayer and resident, was not aware until the tent was removed that we had no emergency services. I too believe that the hospital was providing emergency services. Um, uh, apparently the governor was unaware and that he was reporting back to the governor's office that it was in fact true that since Hurricane Laura, there had been no emergency services in the patch. It was not uh, new to the new board or new because of the windstorm. It had, there had never been services to that point, even though the facility um, was staffed. Uh, by license, even if there's a doctor there, the doctor cannot provide, could not have provided emergency services. Like the rest of the parish that has clinics, uh, emergencies are referred to 911 and the ambulance service. At the uh, April 12th meeting last week, um, we asked um, to formally make the request of you, um, and then we have a meeting scheduled immediately following your agenda meeting for introduction of key personnel and initial coordination of police tree administration, architects, permitting, floodplain requirements, FEMA grant management, and insurance attorneys. I cannot thank um, our parish administrator and our uh, parish engineer, the permitting office, for all of their quick assistance in being able to pull this together um, for today. And we look forward to your <coughs> formal vote this afternoon. What is um, ongoing is that um, the district attorney and I are continuing to meet with potential operators that have reached out to us. Some are for-profit operating companies like Stonebridge was. Others are not-for-profit hospitals, and others are physicians who own and operate hospitals in Louisiana, Arizona, Texas, Mississippi. So we've um, had quite a bit of interest in that. We're also having meetings <coughs> award to sources of additional hospital revenues um, to entice an operator. And then we're uh, also, through um, Ms. Ormontal, having a discussion with Dr. Cavanaugh, that we would like to continue health unit services through the temporary and permanent clinic locations. So operate through the building they were operating in. When the hospital is built, operate through the hospital. And, and Dr. Cavanaugh seems to be um, uh, supportive of trying to do that and to try to get those health unit services out there. Um, and then we also have ongoing discussions with the Louisiana Department of Health, Louisiana Department of Hospitals, Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services, and other entities. So that's this five-page document is a summary of what's taken place in the last seven months. I got a couple questions. Yes, sir. Um, well, I got one question is to the board up here in the Katy. Has anybody with that old hospital board called and contacted anybody that needed a building to do services out of? Y'all get any phone calls from anybody? Because we were blamed that we didn't, we let this escape, and we didn't. Because we didn't get, did you get a phone call? And neither did I. Uh, my next question is the, the previous board sat around for two years and, and hasn't done nothing to secure a, a permanent spot or anything? Is, is what you get, what you reading? I mean, that's, 
that's the question I have. I mean, Mr. Dupont, I can't address prior to. Uh, yeah, I can't. So, so that, again, I, I, giving the board the benefit of the doubt at the time, dealing, working with their architect, they thought they could repair the hospital. Uh, they had an emergency declaration that was done about nine months after the hurricane, so that May or June of 2021. Uh, so that they could go immediately into construction or repairs uh, without the whole bid process. That's what the emergency declaration allows a public entity to do. To go. Um, but at some point, and again, I'm not sure the exact, that they realized that re the repairs based on the initial assessment of the architect were not going to be able to be accomplished at, at the price that was given because they learned that with the hospital, their special regulations and that they were going to have to re rework the electrical plumbing so forth and so on so it in significantly increased the price so that yeah. that was a you know the board again was making a decision with input from uh you know that, that just turned out that they couldn't do it and then as time went by you know and, and so so again that's the two that two years and until you know from from august of 2020 to august of 2022 was focusing on repairing the building, but ultimately uh, that's just not feasible uh, and probably not just not the best use of taxpayer dollars uh, because it needs to be higher. So for instance, what was discussed in the last six or eight months is if you look at the ambulance district building that's right next door to the hospital, <coughs> they had minimal damage. When? No, obviously no water because it was elevated higher. That's what this board feels is the prudent thing to do is build, hosp this hospital is not gonna be as big because we don't have to make it as big. There's different regulations and so forth and so on, but it doesn't have to be, but it needs to be higher and sturdier. And that's their objective. And with the input of their architect, um, that's what they plan to do is provide the emergency services and some limited hospital beds. Uh, again, not as big, but we didn't need as big, but there are, but the size is dictated by federal and state regulations. Um, we're hoping that we can minimize uh, or make it the hospital smaller because we didn't need it. We, but before we had a 10 bed hospital before Laura, we didn't need a 10 bed hospital. We don't need a 10 bed hospital today. Um, but again, those are things that will be worked out based on the state, primarily state regulations. Uh, okay, Mr. Chairman, any questions? Yes, sir. First, I want to thank the board for, for bringing us up to speed on what's going on and for y'all's hard work to get where we are today. I don't want to worry about what happened yesterday. I want to worry about what happens tomorrow. Uh, the second question is, what kind of timeline are we looking for for this clinic to be open and any emergency services to be available? And, and actually, we are asking for that to be expedited. I'd like to introduce you to the, the principal architect in that's going to handle the, both the renovations as well as new construction. Um, they were selected primarily based on experience with elevation, experience with FEMA, and most importantly, experience with hospitals and medical facilities, and that's Josh Huffpower with Huffpower Designs, and he's representing the joint venture, and he'll speak to you. Thank you. Thank you. <coughs> Go ahead. Hey, Tom, I guess uh, we'll go ahead and let's discuss that. Uh, my name is Josh Huffpower, and I'm the partner in charge of our joint venture, Huffpower WHLC Architecture. We have combined 40 years of experience in hospital design here in South Louisiana, as well as, as 20 years of FEMA rebuilding and, and reconstructing and dealing with FEMA process. So I think we're, we're well suited to be able to tackle this in an expedited fashion. Y'all, yes, um, I know when we met and y'all, uh, we were all went through the health unit the other day. Y'all mentioned maybe four to six months, maybe give it have it, have it up and running, maybe. That's uh, that's our goal for urgent care for urgent care, right? For for that clinic building, right? For the uh, health unit building, right? Yeah. I, I guess my question is, is, is the uh, health unit in, in the Lower Cameron? Uh, Uh, I guess it's a question and maybe a probe. The 
board uh, has ever uh, uh, entertained the idea of moving the hospital to the, this area? No, we have not discussed that. I, I, I do think that the location where it is now is because the district is basically <coughs> from the Vermillion Parish line to the ship channel. So it's um, somewhat centrally located. I, I'm, I'm sure I was that, that might have been the reason I'm asking that. I, was, I don't know what our plans are for the help you in the future. Is it, is it ever going to be a help you? Well, that's what we talked about in the staff and, and then talked about is continuing in here. You know, once well, the hospital built, right, they're going to combine them and put them both at where the hospital We, we is, could right. do that. That's the conversation that. Um, but so but if you got a building already, why build a new hospital? Well, so just, just to clarify, and that's what um, Mr. Baird and I were discussing, Louisiana hospital law statute as it is now, there is no, there's a, there are federal regulations that provide for a rural emergency hospital with two beds. That has not been approved by the state. We've been, we've been pretty well informed that will not take place until after the next governor's election at the soonest. So as of now, to actually have emergency services in a temp even in a temporary location, we're required to have 10 beds. That, that's the requirement. We could get, perhaps get a waiver, but no, even if we were awarded a waiver, it still requires some beds. So this facility as it stands, and, and, and Mr. Huffpower can address more specifically, the, stru the internal structure of the hospital does not allow for emergency services. To so you're them. not wanting to use the health unit as a temporary site? Yes, as a temporary clinic temporary site, we unit. definitely are. So, so if it as soon as a, possible. It can be a temporary site, <laughs> yes. but it can be a permanent site too. Not, no. So, so, some of the, so based on the hospital <laughs> regulations right now for the state of Louisiana, would be required to have a minimum of 10 beds. If we have an operator, we could have some off-site urgent care, but as far as emergency services, we could not have that. Um, the, the, host, the minimum hospital technical requirement requires us to have 10 beds, no matter what. That's kind of the law of the land right now. What's, so what's well, going what to change I'm, that? What, what I'm saying is, is my, I'll go back to my question. Right. Temporary site, you've got to have 10 beds. Temporary you site. Put them in Temporary site, we're going to ask for waiver. That's the thing that we're going to ask for waiver. Oh, you're going to ask right. for waiver to not have for the temporary, and then have to put it back. We would have to put it back to a clinic. But hopefully, during that time time frame, we actually buy ourselves some time to have the law changed to where we could could leave that in place at the clinic site. So that's some of the things that we're having to kind of juggle through right now. So we're trying to make sure that we're all on the same page. Our, our the primary number one focus is to have the health unit building prepared to provide clinical type services that have been provided in the for the last two and a half years. Not ER services, just urgent care type stuff. And that's what we want to try to get into that building. To the extent that we can add additional services such as an ER, a temporary emergency room, um, we will try to accomplish that. Don't know if the regulations of the state will allow us, but, but we'll try, so we may. And then what we do with that facility after the hospital is built or how we integrate those two facilities are to be determined. But Mr. Falk, your point of why not consider building the hospital here as opposed to Creole, the board has not considered it, but it's something for them to discuss and they'll, well, uh, and I, mean, I don't know the answer, but it's-, it's being, this is, being this is a discussion, and I always think about being a good steward of taxpayer fair dollars. But as per residents of the parish, the health unit tax covers, I mean, everybody in the parish pays health unit ta tax, right? Correct. Yes. So I'm, I guess I'm thinking that if you're going to build a new hospital mm -hmm. and you're going to put it back where it was and you're going to take some of those same things that, that she was talking about and involving it in with the hospital, what are we going to do with this building? Tear it down? But would it, would it be a better interest of building something where the people population's at? Like they move it north and build some sort of so that, so, so that health unit up there. 
That, well, okay. so that, there's a couple of parts in there. So number one, the geographical district of the Lower Cameron Hospital District <coughs> limits where it can be. But it's intercoastal south, basically. But it does, limit, it does limit the, it does it limit the, Healthy. does it limit the health? Not the health, so, so let, put, uh, health unit is separate. Okay, that's what I said. The hospital is one thing, health unit is another. Health unit is a parish-wide tax, and those services can, can be provided throughout the parish, as Katie can Yes, so Dr. Cavanaugh and I have been in discussion over the last few months about um, erecting satellite offices in every community in the parish. So it's a parish facility site. They're going to have a satellite office, and they'll have office hours in um, every community daily. So that's something that we're working on. We're identifying facilities right now that we can use and they actually have been using the Grand Lake Library, they've been doing their health, their... I'm just, I, I, I appreciate that. I'm just trying to get a, a feel for what we're going to use this health unit building. This building costs us a fortune to yes, sure. and everything. It does. If so we're not going to get a true benefit from it. If you, at one point, are you going to combine the health unit with the hospital? That's perfectly fine. But do we need to still have this and, and, and at some point in the future when the hospital is built and these services can then move to the hospital campus and that's going to be in Creole which is so then you the police chair can decide what to do with that building yeah. in the meantime we'd already talked about elevating the building and, and lease it out if we had to if, if the health you can repurpose it do whatever but again that will be the police chair yeah, it's your it's building you decide what you want to do with it I'm just saying that you're going to for well, the amount of people I think that you may be on the right track of saying that the health unit in the hospital could be combined in some sort of way over there where you're going to build a new one and not have this going and that going because somebody's got to pay the bills. Right. And, and, and it's the taxpayers of the parish. And, and uh, Mr. Falk, we, we would like <coughs> to uh, be the first, you know, to, if, if, if that works, to show that we can successfully operate. So here's the facility for this area, and as Ms. Ormator said, identify a facility in each of the other parts of the parish, and the health unit would operate throughout the parish because it is a parish-wide tax, and the services should be available to the entirety of the parish. So. Now, and that's where I get, that's what I, I, I get at, is that it, 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 the, people, <laughs> the people that rep, I represent have, are feeling like they pay the tax, but they have no benefits sure. from the tax, and for the tax. If and this and works unless out. you can put something in their area that they could benefit from. And I think the plan is to try to do it in an already existing structure that that handles medical services. So this would just be the kind of catalyst maybe to get it done throughout the, uh, the patch. I have a question. And I, I'm, I'm like, uh, Sonny, I, I appreciate the, the old board. The old board did the best that they could do with what they had. The new board has a challenge that they have to meet. My question uh, to you is, the hospital, is that footprint going to be used? Is that building that's there now going to be used? Is that going to be redone? Or are you going to tear that down? You're going to... Mr. Let, let Mr. Hope yeah, it's, it's yes. going to be a complete demolition down to the ground. Really? We'll rebuild uh, according to meeting the 175,000 <coughs> wind zones and as well as the new floodplain uh, coordinates that we'll need to meet to raise the building to that certain height to get it out of the floodplain. So you, you're not going to use any part of that hospital? No. <laughs> well, um, I, I don't know if you're aware, and I, I am because I live next door. Um, those are all modular buildings. That a facade was, and it's been open, not secured at all. I mean, multiple doors, there's multiple access. It's been open to the elements. As I understand it, at one of the meetings, um, the fire suppression system, the, the sprinkler system was not turned off and empty, and in the freeze, it burst, and that further compromised the building. So I would say I'm not the expert, it's beyond me. We went through the clinic building and the hospital last week with our scanners and everything, our kind of gut instinct is that it would probably cost more to renovate the existing hospital as it is because we'd have to tear it down to almost nothing and then try to rebuild it. <coughs> and that would also trigger us having to raise the building and having to do other things. 
So it's going to be a whole lot cleaner just to be able to, get, <coughs> to demolish the building and start over. So, so you're going to remove it and use a footprint right. uh, to. Uh, you don't need your big footprint either. Yeah. <laughs> right. It's got to be elevated. I mean, it, yeah, that's it makes no sense. I understand. I just, I just wondered if you was going to use what was, what was there, if, or, or it's going to be uh, sold, or it's, uh, are you just going to demolish it? Um, I mean, I mean, there's, it's got to be something good there for somebody. So for, for scrap reasons, you know, there's a lot of copper in it. There's a lot of things that could be salvaged as part of, as part of the demolition. So that would, that would reduce the demolition cost because somebody can come in and salvage some that, of that That's stuff. my question. Um, so there are, there are a lot of things that can be can be salvaged for sure. Unless somebody wants to buy it, I go, gosh, and he might want to buy a building, put on a hill back there and make another restaurant or something. But thank you. Jesus, you're welcome. Yeah, I need it. We provided a lot of detail. I don't know that you, the board, needed that much detail, but it was primarily for the public. Yes. Education. No, that was good to um, to, to just let the people have asked questions uh, as to what's happening, what's going on, and why it's taking so long. So we tried to try to provide as much information as possible. Well, we do appreciate the board, the past board, because they, they they had a they had a, a, a job to do, and it, yes. it's a difficult job, and you have a difficult job now. So uh, we appreciate what you did, what you all did. Thank all right. you. Man. I just want to say, no blame game. No, you know, we just just try to get get services back on. An explanation of why we are where we are today. Um, so, you meeting, we appreciate a, uh, a conversation of, of negotiating with the hospital to retain at least that building for the hospital. So, hopefully, within four months, we could get some. We're going to do our best, yes. Yeah. All right. Thank, 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 Thank you. Thank y'all. All right. Moving on to number five <coughs> Tim DuPont, Logan Manual, South Cameron Fire Updates. Sweet. Um, we're ready to move along. We um, we really just need the parish permit. It's gone through. Oh, uh, the fire marshal. Everything's approved through them. So we're basically ready to start. We should have a building in about a month. Which building? And then the that'll be the building in Creo. Creo. And um, at the same time, we're going to start with the building that'll be the uh, accommodation at Ridge Creek. Uh, Ridge Crest and Camille, which is going to be on the front ridge. Recreation Center. Which should start in about a month after the next one's built. So there should be a domino effect for the remainder of them. So everything should be done within about four to six months. Good. I, I like to tell Tim, thank you, him and Logan. All these uh, marsh, all these grass fires and everybody's burning everything. Uh, they work their tails off on all that stuff. And well, there is one very positive thing that I want to say was a great idea for y'all um y'all's parish workers had done excellent with the fire department that is a good. very good thank service you. good and they're a good group of guys and girls thank y'all yeah i know I, I went to a fire in the middle of the night whenever but anthony and them was place burnt and all the parish people showed up over there they were all out there when you can get 15 of them to show up at one o'clock in the morning yeah. that's yeah. excellent pretty good <laughs> so that, that's basically all we need is, is uh, permit to move on, and we should be able to get started within two weeks. Good. <coughs> Good deal. Sam, can you just y'all. elaborate on, on why um, you're building one at the Cameron Rec? I, just so the public knows that because of your district now. What we did was we combined the two buildings. They had one on Ridge Crest, and they had one at um, Camille Road. That was interesting. We're able to combine them and only build back one because of the combination of the fire districts. And we was able to do away with the Oak Grove fire station. So it, it now meets the Creo and the Grand Chenier and Murier. You have to have seven road miles between each station to be considered a fire district, which we do now. There's only one place and we do plan a station for that and it's within the budget. Instead of replacing the Oak Grove fire station, we're gonna put them one on the other end of Little Chenier, because everybody basically past Miss Rena Trahan is over seven miles. So that way everybody, and, and there's a bunch of houses and camps or whatever, that are actually not in a fire district. So we're gonna get something on that end, and they will be in a fire district. 
that should be within, like I said, um, next six months, everything should be done. Uh, uh, Thank you. Yeah. Good deal. Any more questions? No. Thank you. All right, before we go in uh, to Katie's thing, I got a couple green cards. Uh, the first one is uh, Bo Tate with Jeff Davis Electric on an update. Five minutes. All right. Uh, short and sweet. Um, as you said, Bo Tate with Royal Engineering. We're working with Jeff Davis on the 230 system loop. Uh, we just want to give you all a quick update. We did execute contracts with a transmission contractor and a substation contractor. EP Bro is our substation contractor. They have started demo. They worked on Grenchineer and Mishwish substations. They pretty much did all the demo there. And moving to Johnson Bayou. Um, they are moving generators around the Grenchineer to get ready for the construction. Um, on the transmission, we hadn't started any construction yet, but we did execute a contract. They have been ordering materials. So the material ordering process, shop drawings, it, it takes a while. So we won't see any transmission work till probably about July. Uh, same thing with the, with the substations as well, new construction. Um, we are working on the permits as well. Uh, the other, only other thing that we're dealing with is land rights. Uh, Creole substation will be moving. We had some hiccups on the location of that one, so that's still ongoing. And the same thing with the Cameron LNG substation, which would be the tie-in on the, the western side of the system loop. So, any questions, comments? Well, you're moving forward. We're good. Any, any, any uh, discussion on the contract for the bore or the transmission lines over the Nicole? Yeah, so that is the transmission contractor is doing the boring work also. Okay. So everything is underground under the Calcasieu ship channel and the intercoastal and the Mermental. The transmission will be overhead, but the distribution will be underground. Okay, same contractor. Same contractor, uh, Q Quanta, QSIG. So the same one working in Hackberry right now. Any questions? I'm just, I'm, I'm concerned about your, your overhead. That's been a, a major problem in, in uh, every storm we've had. Um, what, what are y'all gonna do to try to uh, uh, save the structures, I guess, is what I'm trying to say. What, I mean. Well, everything, uh, previously nothing was designed to 160 mile per hour wind speed. FEMA did have some consensus based codes and standards which allowed us to go up to that wind speed. So uh, I think you're, Biggest wind speed design was probably to about 80 miles per hour previously. So we're going 160 miles per hour. Uh, we're doing steel poles and steel foundations on all of the transmission structures and the distribution. There's a distribution underbuild on the same transmission pole. So, uh, like in Holly Beach, I'm, I'm sorry, in uh, Homa for the Sleeka Co op, their transmission system, I think four poles were damaged. Um, and they were up and running on their transmission in a matter of days instead of three to four months like, like y'all were out. So that's, that's the hollow galvanized uh, poles you're talking about? Yes, yes, sir. Yep. So we should, we should be in a lot better shape. Thank you, sir. All right. Anything else? But how, how, how deep are y'all putting y'all like uh, the uh, foundations? Foundations, they're, they're going to... They're gonna range, but they're anywhere from 30 to 50 feet and three foot to eight foot in diameter. Plans top, they go plan. Yes, sir. Okay. Yep. And you're driving them? Vibrating, vibrating them down, yep. And they will be setting poles either with cranes or helicopters. Any other questions? No, sir. All right, thank you, sir. All right, thank y'all. Okay, the next one is Caitlin Liu and Katie Bourne, the American National Audubon Society. <coughs> Five minutes. I got it. Hopefully, hopefully I got it. Uh, so good morning, gentlemen. Um, my name is Caitlin Lill. I'm the Senior uh, Program Manager for Coastal Stewardship with Audubon Delta. Uh, I know you all have heard about this Audubon Delta thing for a couple years now. Um, my coworker Brent, I think, was here a few months ago to talk about the Louisiana Outdoors Forever program. And I'm, I'm here to emphasize, I hope y'all are going and getting your money because that is good money and we want people to use it. 
Um, you know, Katie Barnes, our Louisiana stewardship manager, is always saying uh, when she started showing up at these meetings that she probably just looked like the crazy bird girl. Um, and uh, I'm here to say there's at least two crazy bird girls. Um, and actually, there, there's a lot more. And so that's kind of what this Audubon Delta thing is about. You know, it's Arkansas, Mississippi, and Louisiana together. We have thousands and thousands of members. We have hundreds of volunteers in these three beautiful states. Um, and I've traveled a lot now, and I can say that Cameron Parish is one of the most stunning places I've ever been. Um, and that while uh, birds may feel like a very small part of life here a lot of the time, uh, they are also one of the most stunning parts. And they are part of an entire network of northern Gulf Coast nature and environmental stuff. And um, you know we're, uh, we're so appreciative of the support that y'all have shown um, you know, out at Holly Beach, the restoration there, Broussard Beach, Rutherford Beach, all these wonderful places. Um, we're, we're, you're probably gonna keep hearing more from us. That's part of what I'm, I'm here to say. Um, and that you know, we're hoping to get a full-time coastal bird technician down here to help Katie. We're hoping to get an outreach person who's gonna come help at festivals and events and things like that. Um, and you know, just, just emphasizing that we're always here for partnership and conversation. Um, and I know Katie's already done uh, a fabulous job making a lot of connections down here and comes and gives you guys updates. Um, if I'm doing my job as a manager, hopefully within a year or two, y'all are gonna be saying how many crazy bird people are there actually? Because uh, it turns out there's a bunch of us. Um, we're looking forward to that new crab fest at Holly Beach. Um, we're trying to get bird coo uh, beer koozies with birds on them, so look forward to that. Um, and we've got a lot of staff who can't wait to come out and eat some crab, is the truth. Uh, so thanks so much again. Uh, like I said, mostly wanted to come up here and introduce myself um, and say you know, thanks for the ways you've worked with Audubon Delta so far and the ways that I know we'll probably work together in the future. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, Katie, project updates. Do you need a bathroom break? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, let's go. <laughs> okay. Well, it doesn't look like it. Okay, so this is what we're <coughs> going to try to cover today. Um, we're going to go over cash balances or key revenue trends, uh, touch on personnel changes, um, talk about our debt service, grant funds, FEMA PA funds give you a, a recovery project update and just a general project update. Our 2023 cash balances that we started the year uh, with is listed. I'll just touch on general funds, the 10.1 million. That's the one that we really pay attention to. That is your only unrestricted fund that you have. That's what you have to spend at your lawn yacht flush fund. It also subsidizes all of your governmental <coughs> entities. DA's office, clerk of court, uh, judge's office. Um, you take care of the prisoners with that fund. Um, that all comes out of the general fund. Everything else is pretty restricted to, to exactly what it says, road and bridge all the way down to Highbury Fire. One thing that's different that you're probably not used to seeing is the South Cameron Fire Fund. We consolidated Cameron Creole Grant Um That is what they started the year with, 460,000. Now, Cameron Fire has about 850000 That is going to stay in the Cameron Fund that has to be spent in the original Cameron District. I didn't put Grant Engineer on here because it had about 120000 in it, and then Creole Fire had about 16000 but I left those off. Um, your three main revenue sources are listed here. Just kind of gave you a little three-year history. Um, your Avalon tax, it's been pretty steady. Uh, it took a little bit of a dip in 2021 because of the assessments being uh, rolled back because of the hurricane damage, but we're back up to about 1.8 million in 2022. Uh, your severance tax typically stays about the same, and then your road royalty fund, which, which used to be about 15, 20 years ago, uh, 20, probably 20 years ago, could get up to $10 million in a year. It's still relatively low. Um, that's not really something that we would even consider a major revenue source anymore, but it's still your third highest revenue source. Uh, okay, if I can say something, Joe, if I can say something. Go ahead. Back in the day, road royalty was way up there. That's how we used to build blacktop a lot of parish roads. Mm -hmm. I know people are asking every day, when y'all gonna blacktop my road? When y'all gonna do this? When? Well, 
that was like our main source right there, offshore money and stuff like that. And there's none. You know, eight to ten million dollars annually is um, historically is what you could count on, but in the last few years, it's been less than six hundred thousand. So we um, we really don't even depend on that when we're budgeting. We have it in there, but you know, our main budget that we're working with, we're looking at Avalon tax and our severance tax. So anyways, we're, we're around the three, we hold steady around the $3 million mark. That's your general fund, what you have unrestricted to pay for everything and anything else, um, any other capital improvement projects. Just to touch, uh, touch on personnel, uh, back in 2018, you just had a very uh, general administration staff. It's been the same departments since um, probably the last 40 or 50 years, not a lot changed. You had a permitting, you had finance, you had admin. Um, OEP came on line back after Hurricane Rita, but that's typically how we managed the parish, just with those departments. I left Road and Bridge off, it's, you know, it's a restricted fund. This is just kind of what your general fund pays for. Your annual salary is around 988,000 a year in 2018. Fast forward five years later, 2022, um, we have been able to create the first coastal, Affair Depart uh, coastal affairs department, which is Ms. Kara Bonsall, you appointed her last fall, and we created our very own engineering department, which was, we hired Mr. Gary Johnson back in April. Um, those are two things that I think that this administration should be very proud of. Um, it is definitely helpful when we go out and advocate for Cameron Parish and why we need funds, especially coastal funds, to restore and protect our coast. It's nice to have an engineer and your coastal affairs person sitting at the table because it tells the people that you take it <coughs> serious. You take it so serious that you fund an entire department and send them all over the state and even to D.C. advocating for these dollars. And it's been paying off. We've seen a return on that investment. So in, in a five-year gap, that's only 11% increase in salary. I mean, if you were taking a, an average two and a half, three percent inflation rate every year of the last five years, you should have expected about a 20% increase in your salary. So the fact that you added two departments and still only saw an 11% increase, that's a very good accomplishment for this jury. Um, we don't talk about this a lot. It's debt service. Um, we've had some historically. We've paid off a lot over the last 15 years. These are the only two um, bond issuances that we have to date that we pay on annually. The first one is GoMeza, and it's actually funded by your GoMeza revenue. Um, so a few years ago, this jury, actually Cameron Parish was the first parish in the entire country that did this. We set the precedent as you took your $12 million of projected Gomez Revenue, you bonded it out and you built the first round of breakwaters. Rutherford Beach, Long Beach, Little Florida. You repay that every year for 20 years. Your final payment will be in September 2028, but we are actually ahead of schedule. We estimated we were only going to collect about a million dollars a year for 20 years. We've actually already collected in the last six years nine and a half million. So there is definitely potential for us to use those residual funds and invest it back into some more coastal projects, particularly breakwaters. You said your last payment was, the final payment is 2028? 20, 2038. 2038. My mistake, 2038. <coughs> the, next, uh, the next debt service account you have is Hackberry uh, Fire Bond. Um, the community of Hackberry wanted to build a brand new fire station, so they passed a tax on themselves, everyone within the fire district, and uh, borrowed a million dollars, and they built their new fire station in Hackberry. Their last payment will be uh, in March of 2027. But again, this is only uh, paid for by the community of Hackberry. Um, so going into grant funds, just to kind of give you a brief overview of how many millions of dollars this staff has went out and advocated, applied for grants, and collected. Um, some of this is uh, occurring revenue by the state. A lot of it's competitive. Some of it's one-time revenue sources because of COVID. 
but that is listed there. I won't go through all of it unless you just want to ask about a particular one, but it's the total is $82.4 million. That is how much we have handled in the last three years and potentially will implement in the next two years. Um, the main competitive ones that I'll just will point out is capital outlay. 375,000 received to date, and we're requesting 1.9 million this legislative session. Representative Boyot is going to ask the workforce that, that is to fund the North Cameron EOC slash multi-purpose building in Grand Lake. Um, the other competitive, highly competitive one is this water sector commission, $15 million. We applied through a very competitive basis and actually received $15 million to consolidate Cameron Creole and Grand Chenier water systems into one system. We're going through that process right now. A lot of the public <coughs> might see some advertisements in the camera pilot that say that a local bill is going to be filed to separate Cameron sewer from Cameron water. And that is something that has to do with this consolidation because it's two different um, entities and created by the legislature in two different manners. We have to separate it before we can consolidate the water. So Cameron taxpayers, it won't really <coughs> affect you anyway except your bill will look different instead of having a bill that says Cameron sewer and water now when you get your bill you'll see Cameron sewer and then Cameron water it'll just be split that's the only way it impacts you everything else is mainly just um, like I said uh, one time revenue sources uh, or disaster related funds uh, going to our FEMA public assistance funds um, the jury itself, we have received 37, uh, 37 million in federal obligation. That's not our non-federal share. That is how much we are gonna get from FEMA in the recovery process. We have $6.9 million still in reimbursement review. So we can expect by the end of the year to be reimbursed 6.9 million. Other entities, that includes RECs, water districts, um, they're at seven million dollars in federal obligation and they have about eight hundred and seventy eight thousand dollars in reimbursements that are pending so just a, a brief overview of our recovery projects um, OEP pavilion we rejected those bids we were anticipating it to cost three hundred fifty thousand dollars the bids came in double we rejected it we hope to go back out to bid on this, we're gonna change the way we bid things, so especially this particular project. Um, we wanna advertise it. Um, I don't know if you're aware, but Cameron Parish, because of our populations, we're exempt from electronic bidding. We have been doing everything through electronic bidding because it's usually a more competitive way for bidding, but I feel like we have a lot of local small business owners that are general contractors that could definitely handle bidding on this OEP pavilion and do us a fair job at a fair price and they're discouraged from bidding because it's too much hassle to go through the electronic bidding process. So we're gonna rebid this and open it up to just um, accepting paper bids at our office. They're not required to do electronic bidding on that. I feel like we'll probably get a little bit more um, local contractors interested in bidding this job. The rest, uh, West Annex, construction in progress, it has the amount, um, Big Lake ball fields, Mr. Lee, I know this is one of your, your projects. Um, the only thing left is attaching the lights. The poles are set, the cement is curing, and they just have to attach the lights. They are uh, acting within the allotted yes, money sir. that the jury gives them? Actually, uh, a lot less, 94000 and I think we gave $250,000 budget to this project. We were able to get it done for 94000 Well, maybe we could spend some of this Okay. Um, so just a few things like the Grand Lake Fire and Dispatch, um, we had looked at, we did a schematic design of combining our fire station and doing a 911 dispatch station in one. That way our 911 dispatchers didn't have to evacuate in the event of a storm. They could just stay put in Grand Lake. Um, it's through 60% design. We're still trying to get the funding together for that. So what we're doing is we have a lot of PW projects that the jury decided not to replace those buildings. 
So we want those to be donors to this project. So it doesn't cost, any, cost you anything out of your general fund. It's gonna just be unused um, PW funds. So we're still waiting to get some of those, um, that revenue secured before we go further. So uh, for uh, in the interim, we're building um, a temporary fire station in Grand Lake. It's gonna be um, perpendicular to, well actually parallel to the Cameron Council on Aging. They're working on it today. It should be um, completed by mid-May and uh, it's about $60,000. And it's gonna be a metal building with the bay, but they're just doing, I think, a aggregate bottom. They're not gonna pour concrete. It's just gonna be a station to house the fire trucks until we can get further through this uh, Grand Lake Fire Station and dispatch design. So it's, we're looking at probably two years before we could finish the dispatch and fire station design. By the time you do bidding and, to, and the, the funding secured. So we're gonna take care of that for Ms. Dinah. Two years with construction. Sir? Two years with construction. Yes, sir, right. two years. It's okay to help the sheriff. Thank you, Slow. The sheriff is, uh, I remember him saying he would help. Yes. Or is that dispatch and uh, help on the cost of the, I guess, facility or, or what's? Yeah, so the sheriff did come. He committed to pay him for um, his expense as it relates to um, some of the dispatcher. He's going to also use it as sort of a satellite office, you know, for them to go do their papers. So he committed to that. But right now we don't really have a, a hard cost on what that what that looks like. We've kind of just, um, we've paused this project <coughs> until we can get these other two PWs. Um, uh, the donor PW secured, be allocated to this. What happens if the new sheriff comes in and he doesn't want to participate? Do we have some sign from the sheriff department? I mean, we get ready to have a sheriff election this year. That's true. And we're going to have a new sheriff. I mean, maybe. So, maybe our, our, our DA can help us get a CEA in place if they want to sign it. I mean, I think the sheriff, he. The new sheriff wouldn't take office until July of 2024. Is that correct? Yeah. So we have a year left with Sheriff Johnson. Yeah, but we got two years with construction. Yeah. Yeah, I, I think I'd talk with the DA, try to get something in place, just in case. Okay. I mean, I don't see the either one of them want to do anything yeah. different, but you never know. Um, so. North Cameron EOC multi-purpose building. That's just another one I want to touch on. That's our um, the what's going to replace the fireman center. <coughs> like it's going to be a multi-purpose building, but it's going to have a section of it that's dedicated to the OEP office for them. It's going to be a, a wind-rated room, shelter in place, um, and have a little media room and office so we can stage our uh, operations there in the event of another disaster. It would also have enough flex space that we could erect petitions and house all of our governmental entities in that one building together. Instead of everyone being spread out in Jennings to Solar Board Parish like we were for the war. This is moving along. Um, you know, it's my expectation that we're gonna get the capital outlay grant. I know Representative Boyock is fighting hard. This is one of his priorities. Um, it's a 1.9 million that he's going for. And if we get it, uh, we would know by July be able to sign a CEA um, in the fall of 2023, we'd be able to go to bid in early 2024. That's the timeline. For the North Cameron, EOC. North Cameron EOC. The rest is mainly construction and progress from the Livestock Pavilion in Cameron, the maintenance barn, Grand Lake bids are due April 27th, uh, Grand Chenier and Cameron Fire Station uh, being repaired, URA is in construction. Uh, courthouse and jail, it's uh, on the agenda to accept the bids today. They were very competitive and within our cost estimate at 1.2 million. Um, so we would expect you guys to, we would recommend that you would accept it. Um, and then Holly Beach Fire Station is in construction. The um, livestock for the, how far along were they on that? They're working on the roof right now of a local uh, metal roofing contractor who's making all the repairs. Is there the time frame of when they may be through with that building? Oh, like next month. Oh, okay. Yeah. It, so we'll it will no be problem. ready we'll for no this, the, livestock the livestock show. show. It will be ready for the livestock show. Okay, good. 
Um, other entity recovery projects, I kind of just gave you a status on that, all of the different rec districts. Um, Cameron Library, their bids uh, came in, you know, we had a bid opening yesterday. They're gonna consider that at their next library board meeting. Um, their Lowry one, they voted not to repair it at that time. The Cameron EMS station that was formerly on that hill coming into Cameron, that board decided not to replace that station, so you will not see any progress there. Um, Holly Beach Water Tower, we have some issues with that. The board had purchased property from DOTD to build the new water tower, and um, FEMA EHP will not allow them to relocate the water tower because it is within a COVID zone. Yeah, and Higgins' uh, representative was supposed to be here this morning. I don't see her. Oh, there she is back there. We're going to get with you after the meeting and discuss okay. it. So we, we do have some issues with that particular PW. Um, everything else is, you know, the possibility to get an update from them. Um, South Cameron High School gym is pending a FEMA obligation and uh, their Hackberry VOAG building, they're estimated to complete that in May and that concludes the school board's recovery projects. Um, just an overall general project update on what the staff's doing that's not recovery related. Um, our Marshall Street inundation project designed at 80%. Um, right now we have about $90,000 in erecting the, the berm to provide, to prevent the tidal um, surging into Marshall Street and Cameron. Uh, we thought that was the main problem, but now that the berm's up, it's, it looks like it has something to do mainly probably on DOTD side. Is there? Okay, Shane, did they ever put that COVID in at uh, <clears throat> Bob's T-Boy between? That's, that's where the problem's at. All that water's backing in right there. No, yeah. Joe told me yesterday they got COVID by Monkey Island. We got to find it. Okay. He, he was supposed to look for it. All across where the Monkey Island landing was at. One there, but they also T-Boy's right there. If, they, if there's no cover with flat, that's coming right there. Oh, yeah. 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 Right yeah, it comes into the road right there and all through all this. But we do have the permit for that project. Okay. So we're moving that, no, forward. That go over there for that flat. Okay, sorry. We have the state DNR permit. We're waiting on the core, which should be any day. I just seen somebody put some on Facebook the other day, so I called them. I know that that was. That's all that's left. Yeah. We are working on it, and then the last phase of that project would be um, putting a <coughs> compensation, or actually two right. compensations. Um, that's a little bit more expensive. We do have a capital outlay grant to do preliminary design, um, but when it comes to purchasing the pumps, we're either going to have to apply for a grant or get the general fund to allocate mm -hmm. capital project dollars. Mm -hmm. uh, King's Bayou Pump Station, that permit is still pending. Um, the Mermitol inundation, um, that's a $25 million pro uh, project through um, its CWG funds. It's expected to bid in July. And uh, Klondike Fire Station is a new one. Um, our facility maintenance crew is going to do, go assess it, but what Klondike, uh, Klondike Fire Station is requesting is we tear out the middle office. It used to, before, Road and Bridge built their own separate maintenance barn. They shared the maintenance barn with the fire station and there was an office and bathroom in the middle. Now that the Road and Bridge has their own maintenance barn, they've requested that we assist them in tearing out that office. We're planning to spend maybe $25,000 on that. We're gonna use force to cut labor for that. Shoreline protection at Rockefeller is expected to bid in May. That's an $11 million project. Our shoreline protection at Little Florida and Rutherford um, it's about $8 million. We're waiting on our IGA with CPRA, um, so we're ready to go with that one. Uh, Gary's Landing Boat Launch, uh, waiting on some survey um, on, of the ramp, but other than that, we're ready to, to issue a PO to order the slab. That's about $150,000 allocation. And then Hackberry FFA Lane, um, catch basins need to be sealed, and that was a $145,000 project. And these are the only open projects right now. So uh, as we close out the year, what this staff is uh, is focusing on, and, and if you want to add to any of it, just let me know, but uh, I have the bullet points here. Of course, our, our main priority is finalize the cost estimates of CPRA for our hurricane protection burn. We had a meeting with them earlier this week. 
uh, we expect to, to have that in hand um, by the end of the year. Once we have our cost estimate, then we can start going for funding for A and E and even construction. <coughs> for what? A hurricane protection firm for the entire parish on the coastline okay. and up the ship, up the ship channel. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Where do we stand on PBDR? Somebody, does anybody have any idea? Yes, um, that was the contractor that was here requesting a change order. That's the first round of PPDR batches. Okay, um, so so that's going to be a hold up again. Possible. Yes, Very possible. possible. On our on our burn protection, where, where are we standing on that right now? That's what she was saying. That's well, so we're working with CPRA. They have committed to doing a cost estimate for us for this firm based off of our proposed alignment. They're going <coughs> to do some preliminary modeling. Um, it's going to take a, you know, the rest of the year to, to work through that, but we're expecting to have a cost estimate by the end of the year. Good. All along the coast? Oh, coast. Yeah. Katie, i got a question over here. Uh, whenever CP2, whenever CP2 happens and venture goes to start dredging out Monkey Island, mm -hmm. We need, to, we need to see about getting with whoever we need to get with and, and Our, see about dredging that spall and putting all that dirt yes. on the front and eventually using that with dozers and let it dry and, and use the pro levy. Yes, sir. So our port director, Ms. Kim Monte, has been working on designating some spool sites for exactly that. We, um, we're going to work on that. We're actually looking at purchasing um, property throughout the parish that could, that could accommodate that type of work. So well, I mean, the best uh, we use it for that levy, right. you know, that'd be the best thing to do. Yes, sir. We are working on that. Have we been successful with trying to get a hold of the Corps in New Orleans on anything or not? We uh, we have not scheduled a meeting with them yet. I don't think we're ready for that yet. We want to get a little bit further along okay. with CPRA um, and this cost estimate and let them do some modeling on our proposed alignment because it might have to shift depending on what the models say. We don't want to go to the core until we're pretty certain on what our alignment is going to look like. We got any alignment on our representation for uh, helping us out with the core on the dredging of the intercoastal water? On the intercoastal, um, I know Alex Guillory, specifically for the Marmontal, is has sent in his letter to Higgins and to the core to reconsider the uh, operation plan of the locks. Uh, I know they're working on that. We sent in our request to about to the Corps about the intercoastal, um, asking them to prioritize dredging it. Um, we did forward all of the information that we had, uh, dredging um, history of the intercoastal to Alex Guillory. He's a private engineer that does a lot of pro bono work for Jeff Davis Parish. Um, he's going to crunch the numbers and see what he can find. What is the, uh, does anybody know of the status that uh, that was brought up about the, the gauges, the, the old gauge and the new gauge that the court is using to justify uh, the water levels in that basin. <coughs> so Scooter brought it up, and and I'm wondering there was it, to me it sounded like there was some uh, uh, inaccuracies on what the court was using. Their whole 
holding more water in that basin right now than they used to. And it's affecting a whole bunch of people in a whole bunch of areas. And it needs to be resolved. And they, they uh, our federal delegation ought to be able to help us with that. At least get some answers, if nothing else. I believe. And I don't want to say that publicly. You say you don't want to say it publicly. Go ahead, Katie. So, um, the next determine the feasibility of self insuring, uh, self insuring our parish assets. You know, that's something that we're working on, um, similar to what we did with our workers' comp. You know, a few years ago, back um, probably 20 years ago, workers' comp got really expensive. So, we were able to get permission and get approved to self insure ourselves workers' comp. We take money every year, we put it into a trust fund, it can only be used for workers' comp, <coughs> we pay everything out directly. And then we just have a separate, like, high um, endorsement policy just for any incidents workers' comp related that would exceed, like, you know, $50 million. And it's a lot, it's a lot cheaper. So we're, we're taking that idea and trying to apply it to um, insuring our buildings. If we were able to build up a create a trust fund um, infuse it with our general fund dollars and our taxpayer dollars at what threshold does it have to meet to where we can say we are 100 percent self-insured we can cancel all of our private insurance policies and self-insure moving forward um, all of our assets throughout the parish i think the school board might be interested in something like that you know as it stands we're paying what two million dollars a year right now just for insurance, and then we see what happened with Laura. They come in, you get you know less than 10% of your premium. Um, it stretches on for two years, and you still end up having to sue your insurance company to get your money. So if we were able to self-insure, um, that might be something that would be a benefit to the to the parish first, and and provide some some relief to these smaller districts that are seeing in, you know increasing insurance costs. So it's just an idea we're exploring. <coughs> We don't know if it's legal, if it's not legal. Um, we don't even know what that amount looks like. We would, of course, have to hire a third party, like an actuary firm, to, to run the numbers for us. But that's just some ideas that we that your staff is working on right now to get to a point to present to you. Um, secure funding and bid North Cameron EOC. Uh, create the taxing district for Klondike and Lowry Drainage Board. That's Mr. Thomas's uh, pet project. They've been requesting that for a few months now, so I think we're moving forward with that. Um, assist the beachfront district in obtaining the state lands lease in the Holly Beach. They're wanting to do um, something similar to what Rutter was done at Rutherford Beach with their funds. Um, secure funding and bid our Grand Lake Fire and Dispa uh, Dispatch Station. Um, assist Grand Lake Rec in bidding a new recreation facility. We're close on a FEMA determination. I know every month it feels like FEMA tells us it's close. I do see it moving through the obligate through the different reviews. It's not just sitting in one section's review. It is moving. It's just not very fast. But I think we're really close to getting that 50% determination. Okay. Why are you on that right there, Gary? Where are we at on the temporary buildings? Uh, I think we hit a snag or something. Uh, where are we at to moving forward on giving them some answers on their buildings up there. Which one? The Grand Lake Temporary. The Grand Lake Temporary Rec Buildings. They were waiting on fire marshal approval. That's where we're waiting on the fire marshal. Yes, sir. Uh, I talked to the buildings. I talked to Tremaine at the end of last week. Okay. Well, I mean, uh, Thomas just texted me this morning, wanted to know where we was at. So that's what Tremaine told me, because I had asked as well. Okay. All right. And so the last one was assist Cameron Water in bidding their South Cameron Water Consolidation Project, which is that $15 million um, water sector commission grant. So that's what our focus is um, for the remaining remainder of the year, as well as closing out a lot of these recovery projects. Our project wasn't listed on this report. It's because it was already prepared and placed back in service. So we're definitely getting to the end of our recovery phase. Um, Thank goodness. <laughs> and um, with that, I just would like to say, and I, I hope you guys um, can appreciate this, this, that the staff over the last three years 
in a time where employees can leave and go get paid double in the private sector to do less work. You've been able to retain your staff. Um, a lot of change. We've had a lot of reorganization, a lot of new departments. Sometimes we were changing things every two months to, to find out, uh, find something that, that worked best for us. Um, with, with COVID, the loss of a coworker, two hurricanes, you know, you were able to retain a lot of your staff and they've done it. Sometimes they didn't always like it, but they respected the decision of the jury. They supported you and they're still here today. And so I'd like to thank all of them and I hope you know the public appreciates them because a lot of times all they get is complaints. They don't ever get any appreciation. And so I hope that the public that's listening, they can understand that how committed the, that the staff is to the parish because most places um, they have a large turnover of staff they go whoever pays the most and you're able to keep these people here through a lot of turmoil so we appreciate you guys thank y'all miss robin don't get any complaints does you <laughs> i think y'all have all done an excellent job every time i've ever called over here i needed something every one of you has been over backwards to get it done I want to thank you. So I think that was long enough spiel. Is there anything I missed? Anybody got any questions? Okay. No, but I have a comment after. Thank y'all for y'all's job. That's it, Katie. Are you got? Um, yes, sir. Agenda, I guess. All right. Just a heads up, guys. Uh, I'm going to be asking uh, the district attorney to come up with an ordinance on restricting access on the uh, breakwater rocks. Uh, we, in case you don't know, we had a multiple drowning in our area uh, recently. Uh, there's been numerous ones, numerous ones in the uh, Russell Beach area uh, near drownings. And uh, you know, I think it's our responsibility to, uh, to, to educate the public because a lot of people come here to go swimming and they have no idea about currents and rocks and whatever and they'll climb up on those rocks and slip and hurt themselves. But also the, the new rocks, they have changed the, some of our currents along the beach and in rough weather, high, high tides, different things, the currents increase. People need to be aware that those currents increase. So uh, we've already put some signage out. And, uh, thank you guys for supporting us on that. We're probably gonna be doing some more. But I'm gonna be asking for an ordinance that allows the Sheriff's Department to uh, keep the people off the rocks uh, we, we didn't, I'm going to do it today, but we're going to probably do it at our next meeting. So I wanted to make you all aware of that. And uh, I'm going to ask Katie and then when we go in our permitting session, I noticed that they have signs out there to keep people from anchoring on the rock or putting boats up against a rock, that they include signage that says uh, uh, not accessible by, by public. Do not get on the rocks. Do not, you know, uh, under penalty of law. We can put all the signs we want, but we need some, we need some, uh, that's right. Because that's where, they, that's where, that's where, where the ordinance is coming from. Whenever they got to pay a fine for climbing a bird up on them. We'll be talking about it at our next meeting. I just want to let you all know. Well, the only thing is, if, if there would be a way to, a lot of people want to surf fish. So if we have rocks everywhere, you know, it's hard for them to, to be able to surf fish. So somehow or another, we need to come up with a, with, with a walkway over the rocks around our local beaches. That way people can cross over and get on the other side of the rocks and go fish instead of trying to cross over the rocks themselves because they're going to want to fish. People want to fish. How are you going to fish on this side of the rocks, you know, trying to? Look, we got the P-Limit signs that says 55. Uh, not too many people follow, so I'm, I'm sure people are going to do what people are going to do. No, no, it's I'm our sure. responsibility to, as much as we can, educate the public that that's dangerous and we don't want them on there and they're under penalty of law, they should not be on it. Right. So I understand that, but a way to get over the rocks. Yeah, but you don't know the side of the fish. You got too many sets of rocks to be able to put something. No, no, I'm just talking about like a Redford Beach, put a couple spots, and hot, the Holly Beach or whatever. I mean, uh, put a couple spots. You know, just this, this, this a walk over. That's that's. Yeah, we can. <coughs> I think there's some grant yeah, out there for that, that as long as it's used for like fishing. And I just want to make you aware. We definitely need something like that. All right. Anything else, Katie? If you got. All right. Yeah. Review our, that's the review our agendas. Mr. Robin, uh, on the uh, 
demolition of the house next to the Ag Building in Hackberry. Where do we stand on that, please? That's uh, that's under the PPD or correct? Batch. No. Yeah, no. it's on the list. We bumped it up to batch two. It got moved up. It's all approved, ready to go. All now need the contract. We're gonna bid batch two and three together. I'd like to move that. Four. I, I'd like to get that taken care of as soon as possible. Like I said, it, that's a, in a school area, and you know how the kids are. So, I mean, hey. something we got to do something. Unless you want to take it out of the program, then the parish would address it. <coughs> that's the only other option. I mean, we moved as quick as we can. We bumped it down. Well, I, know it's not, I, I know it's not your fault. I'm just saying that. No, I'm just telling you the process. Yeah. So that's where we're at. If you want to expedite it, then you have to take it out of this program and then take care of it through the parish. Yeah. Well, I'll talk to the other George, but that needs to be done. I mean, something like that's, uh, I think it's pretty important. Okay. Any other questions on the agenda? We're re reviewing the agenda. I got yeah. uh, two. I got one on 20. What is, what is number 20? So I'm going to ask for an add-on for the Beach District number one. And I'm going to ask that we uh, are going to be appointing Chad Cooper to an open seat. So if we can get that in on an add-on, appreciate it. Mm -hmm. Put that on add-on. We can put it on an add-on. Okay. Anything else on the agenda? Just the warning. Anything else, Scott? I don't, I don't see anything other than uh, okay. Have anybody else, has anybody else applied for any food service trucks or down here? No, but uh, I did provide the checklist uh, to Mr. Cannon. Okay, because Johnny, I know you I, had I don't see questions. John back there now. But you, you had questioned me about that, but yeah. Um, yeah. I know John's wanting to get one. He's getting him a trailer. Uh, item 23, that's the Marshall Street Pump Project. It's on the agenda for um, authority to sign proposal, but we're gonna ask that you grant us authority to negotiate fees with an A&E firm um, to do the Marshall, the completion of Marshall Street um, design. Um, we're negotiating fees right now with, with Leonard, and so that amount's not set. We can, so we're gonna ask that you make that. <coughs> Anybody got anything else? All right, see y'all at two. Meeting is adjourned.